What's the scariest 100% true story you've heard of? Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the video. A few years back, I went out to the Blue Martini in Tampa with a girlfriend. We just wanted to get dressed up and dance a bit. I ordered one small drink and nursed it the whole time we were there. I had just finished dancing and needed the ladies room. When I came out, she was gone, and sitting at the table with my purse and my drink were the two guys we were dancing with. They told me she said she had to leave and that they'd see me out. I tried calling her, and she wouldn't answer. It all came out later that she was annoyed because the guy dancing with me had turned her down, and she felt rejected. FFS. I felt relatively safe because we'd been dancing with these guys almost all night and spent a lot of time together. Like the innocent, naive girl I was, I took two, maybe more, sips of my drink but didn't finish it. I wasn't drunk. At least I wasn't then. I do remember telling them goodnight and refusing their offer to escort me to my car. The next thing I remember is waking up the security guard who saved me, a man who I hope has been blessed since that day. He said he watched me come down the escalator and saw the two men close behind. He got a very bad feeling, so he followed us. When they realized he was following them, they trailed off, and he watched me get into my car. Apparently, I locked the door and just zonked out. Whatever they dosed me with worked in that very brief walk from the top of the escalator to my car door. He said he stood there waiting until they drove off and decided to check on me. When he knocked on the window and I was telling him gibberish, he knew something was off, either I was drunk or drugged. The cops came the whole thing. I just remember them asking me about these men, details, etc. I was sick, felt like I was in an oven, and, I'm so sorry, a projectile vomited right there. They'd roofied me. They were no doubt planning on hurting me, but that hero, that sweet young man who kept an eye out, thank God, saved me. When the gravity of it all hit me, I went back there another day to hug and thank him. He just politely told me, no, ma'am, it was nothing. I have a mom and two sisters, and I would want someone to protect them too. When I was seven, my mom and older sister, ten, and I were walking down an unlit path late at night. This was when I used to live in Russia, and we were coming back from her friend's house. I turned around and saw a man walking about 50 feet behind us and warned my mom that I was scared. She said it's just someone walking home too, and you calm down but to quit looking behind me. I looked behind me again, and he was suddenly a lot closer. I started pleading with her that he was coming after us. We all started speed walking, but he quickly caught up to us and put a knife in my mom's throat. My mom yelled, girls, run. And we took off. During this time, my mom was applying for a visa and had a lot of important documents in her purse, and she yelled, sister, catch my purse. To which he said if she threw her purse, he would kill her. My sister and I ran nonstop about a mile home and told my mom's live-in boyfriend that someone attacked and took our mom. I don't know why calling the police didn't occur to any of us, probably because the police didn't give a crap in that region of Russia. The boyfriend actually asked us what we wanted him to do, to which I yelled at him to go find her and gave him a steak knife. Seven-year-old me sat by the front door with a, butter, knife for hours, waiting for the boyfriend to return with my mom. He returned a few hours later without saying he couldn't find her. I was livid and told him to keep looking and not to come back without her. She returned mid-morning beaten to a pulp, beyond recognition. Her clothes were torn, and she had no pants or underwear. The guy took her behind some sheds, raped her, and beat her. After he left, she walked a mile or so home in broad morning light, half naked and covered in blood, and nobody even stopped to help her. On November 15, 1966, two young couples were joyriding around in a black 1957 Chevy to a remote hangout spot north of Point Pleasant known as the TNT area. One of the couples was Linda Scarberry and Roger Scarberry, the other was Steve Millett and Mary Millett. When they got there next to the abandoned North Power Plant, they suddenly saw two large red eyes that reflected the light from the car's headlights. Steve noticed it first and pointed it out to the group. That is when they are said to have noticed that the glowing red eyes belong to a strange creature. They claim to have seen a grey man-like figure with wings go around the corner at the old power plant. They said that the creature didn't run but wobbled like it couldn't keep its balance. Linda described the creature as having circular fiery red eyes and a body like a man but with wings. They said the creature was about six or seven feet tall, with wings folded against its back. Half man, half monster. She said, you could see muscles in its legs. The couple couldn't believe what they had seen. They quickly drove off onto Route 62. Linda yelled for Roger to hurry. The couples then saw the creature on a hill by a large billboard as they went around a curve. 
It spread its wings and went straight up into the air. They were all terrified and kept yelling for the driver to go faster. The Mothman began gliding back and forth over the back end of their car. We didn't know what it was. I don't think we've ever been so scared, said Linda. As they went along a straight stretch of road, they were going over 100 miles per hour, but the creature was still able to follow them. They saw it in the back window and saw the shadow go across the car as it flew. They couldn't get away from it. They could also hear the wings hitting the top of the car as they drove. It's even said to have left scratch marks on Roger's 57 Chevy. Squeaked like a big mouse, said Mary Millette. They were only able to get away from the Mothman when they reached the edge of Point Pleasant. The creature disappeared, veering off into a field as they went into town. The couples continued going into town. They stopped at the local Dairyland as they tried to figure out what to do next. Linda suggested they go to the police, but Steve and Roger thought they'd just laugh at them and wanted to go back to make sure the thing was still there first. The group ended up being too afraid to do that, so they turned around. As they were turning around, they saw a large dead dog laying along the road, which was gone when they went by again later. According to the couples, the winged creature jumped out as they passed where the dead dog was, went over the top of the car, and went through the field on the other side. They drove back into town, parked at Tiny's Diner, and decided to contact the police. The teens told their story to Deputy Millard Halstead. They told police that they saw a large winged creature whose eyes glowed red when the car headlights picked it up. They described it as a flying man with 10-foot wings following their car. Halstead didn't believe them at first but knew that they weren't troublemakers and saw that they were genuinely terrified, so he actually went out to investigate their story. The couples drove back out to the TNT area with the deputy. Millard shined a spotlight around the area, including the tree lines. Deputy Halstead is said to have heard strange static disturbances coming from his radio that he couldn't explain, but he found no clear sign of the creature itself. The witnesses were sitting in their cars and said that they saw shadows circling nearby and a cloud of dust kick up from an adjacent coal yard. The mallets were too scared to go back to their homes, they stayed at Scarberry's trailer, turned all the lights on, and stayed awake all night from fear. The following day, Sheriff George Johnson held a press conference to discuss the sightings. The local press began printing the story and named the creature Mothman, based on the comic book character Batman, who had just gotten a television series at the time. Steve Millette told the local newspaper, We understand people are laughing at us. But we wouldn't make up all this to make us. That same day, the couples went back to the TNT area during daylight and found odd-looking tracks resembling two horseshoes put together, but smooth. Steve saw something fly up inside a boiler when a door was kicked open. No one stayed around long enough to see what it was. After this original sighting, more and more people began reporting seeing similar things, such as Marcella Bennett's sighting, which happened a day later. Hundreds of cars full of eager people swarmed out to the TNT area at night in hopes of seeing the Mothman. A shadow was cast over the valley of Point Pleasant, and thus began the legacy of West Virginia's Mothman. I got attacked by a ghost, I think. One night, I'm in bed with my boyfriend. We recently lived in a 200-year-old building, a former fisherman's mission right on the harbor. During the night, I have an event that could normally be explained away by sleep paralysis, if not for a few peculiarities. From my point of view, asleep or otherwise, I suddenly have a force pinning me down and grabbing at my throat. As far as I'm concerned, I'm awake, and I fight with fucking everything against this pure doom and anger bearing down on me. I'm game for a scrap when the need presents itself, this goes on for a while, and boom, I get a flash of a face, right in my own, of a middle-aged guy with a beard, and I'm released. From his point of view, he wakes up to me wide-eyed and thrashing, apparently, my veins in my throat are huge, and I'm gurgling and trying to shout. I'm red, pretty fucked up, and very pissed off. He thinks he probably has sleep paralysis and is scared to wake me, so we meet again after the flash of the bearded guy. Now I'm sweating and fucked up, I remember everything exactly as it happened, and he is super uneasy as well. Now, this dude doesn't have an imagination, which helps me rationalize what happens next. We both are now sitting up in bed, and we realize the room is freezing and just feels really fucking off. We look to the wall in front of us at the end of the bed, and there are black lines being drawn, in no pattern or order, right across the white painted wall. I get out of bed and look at this, we are hallucinating, right? Bang off the wall to the side, our full laundry basket tips over violently, and I bravely superman back onto the bed. The temperature goes back to normal. We don't sleep the rest of the night. Whatever happened, it wasn't sleep paralysis, and something really didn't like me. Nothing else ever happened again in that place. That was about 20 years ago, and I've had a handful of supernatural experiences since awake and asleep. I keep an open mind to it all.
I'm an engineer, and logic is king to me, some shit we can't explain. My hometown, a suburb of Detroit, is routinely ranked as one of the safest cities in America. It has been all my life. So the quintuple murder that happened here when I was in middle school stuck out. We had a jewelry store named Italia Jewelry, and the owner did his own commercials, so Marco Pesce was a well-known member of the community. He was probably prominent in other ways, but I personally remember seeing the commercials as a kid. On December 21, 2002, a pair of dirtbags broke into his house. His mother, who was visiting from Italy for the holidays, was the only one home at the time and was taken hostage. Marco returned and dropped his three kids, ages 6, 9, and 12, off without going inside, grandma's there to watch them, and he's heading to work. The kids, of course, walked in to find two gun-wielding men with designs on their dad's safe. The combination is something only Marco knows. So his oldest, it is suspected, is forced to call Italia Jewelry and ask his dad to come back. Marco comes home to the hostage situation and, as far as we know, immediately complies with the men's demands. The safe and the rest of the house are ransacked of anything valuable. The two men murder the entire family. The family's absence is quickly noticed, and the horror show at their home is quickly discovered. When the news breaks, the uncle of one of the killers goes immediately to the cops. The dude had bragged that he'd just done something that would be on CNN. It turned out the uncle didn't find the murder of children anything worth bragging about. The killers were very quickly caught and sentenced in under six months. It is quite probably the single worst crime in the history of Livonia, Michigan. I grew up in North Texas. I lived the first 15 years of my life in a medium-sized town around 30 miles from Dallas. We have a historic downtown and plenty of ghost stories, considering some of these buildings date back to the late 1800s and early 1900s. It's something that was brought up in our fourth grade history lesson while learning about our city and is usually never referenced again. On this day, I had family visiting from East Texas, which is around five hours away. My older cousin, who was 18 at the time, is a self-proclaimed witch. Talking to spirits, visions, all of that jazz. We were walking around downtown when we stopped at a restaurant to grab lunch. This particular building is a historic hotel built in 1912. It is about four stories tall with a basement. At this point in time, it housed one restaurant and boutique on the ground level, followed by a hair salon a few floors up. I was around 11 and had just jugged some water, so I needed a restroom. The only restroom was in the creepy, unfinished basement. She agreed to take me, as I frankly refused to go alone. This basement held creaky stairs that led down to concrete flooring. There was one overhead light and a random old couch. It was probably 20 by 20 feet large. There were two doors, one to the male and one to the female restrooms. Like most of us in creepy basements, I was freaked out. My cousin and I entered the female restroom. The only light in this room is the little windows on the walls up high, where you can see the shadows of people walking past. There are four or five stalls. I do my business, and I'm washing my hands. All of the stall doors slam shut at the same time. The room goes pitch black in the middle of the day. The only sound? A little girl is crying. My cousin and I sprint upstairs. My dad investigates but finds nothing. My cousin and I were alone. So, we do some research. We learn that when the hotel was actually a hotel, there was a girl about my age who died in the basement. There used to be a pool in the basement. Her father sent her to the pool with the promise he'd be down soon. She drowned in the pool from negligence. She died sometime in the 1940s. I've been back to that hotel a few times through the years. I still refuse to go to the basement. I have a couple. Both take place in the desert. I'll try to keep it brief. For my birthday, my boyfriend wanted to take me to a place on the Arizona River that has always been my favorite place. My best friend was dating one of his friends, so they came along too. As did a few other people, but they were in separate cars. I live in California, so those who are familiar are familiar with the one hella long road that leads you in and out of Arizona from California. The day that we had left to go back home, my friend was driving, I was in the passenger seat, and the boys were in the back. I was vibing, minding my own business, half asleep because I sleep awfully in hotels, and we had been there for the last five or so days. Something happens to my friend's car, it breaks down, and we're forced to call the police so they can send a tow truck out to us as we have literally no service, so they were our only option. We're about three hours into the drive at this point and in the middle of nowhere, so we're going to be waiting a long time, and we know it. At about dusk, my friend and her boyfriend were asleep in the back of the car. My boyfriend and I were sitting in the trunk doing our own thing. All of a sudden, in the not too far distance, we see three people walking by. 
there was no car around that dropped them off, and I have no idea where they could have possibly come from. It's almost like they just magically appeared. We don't think much of it at first, the desert is full of weird people, but I'm also a little weirded out by it, so frankly, it wasn't any of my business. About an hour later, we're still waiting, it's dark now, and those same people walk by again, heading back in the direction that they came from, but there's only two of them. I didn't tar anything suspicious, but I don't know what could have happened to the third guy. It's not like they were in the middle of the city, where they walked him back to his place. There was nothing but desert as far as the eye could see on both sides. I always thought that it was creepy. We watched them until they got out of sight. Same road, several years earlier, I was with my mom, my dad, and a friend of theirs, who are serious rock hounds, so a lot of time was spent out in the desert. There's a certain part of this drive that is very hilly. They aren't enormous hills, but they're big enough that when one car goes over, you can't see them anymore. It was dark outside at this point, my mom and dad, in particular, had been out in the sun all day and were probably exhausted. As we are driving, all of a sudden, we all see a man riding his bike. Going up and down the hills, just as we are. A reminder that we're in the middle of the desert, hundreds of miles from the next town, so seeing a guy riding his bike like he's in the middle of a neighborhood is a little weird. We watched him for a long time, then he eventually went over one hill, and we never saw him again. He literally vanished. I don't know where he could have possibly gone without someone in the car seeing him. Thinking about this still creeps me out. When I was in my late teens, my friends and I decided to go to a local beach town to spend the weekend. We all had a great time during the day at the beach and swimming pool. It was off season, and there weren't too many other people around. Late at night, we all decided to go for a walk and chill by the ocean. It was quite dark as the beach had no lights. Our hotel was about 4 or 500 meters away, and the only light coming was basically from the moon and the streets way in the distance. We were all sitting on the sand, about 20 feet from the water, smoking a joint or two. One of my friends saw something and pointed out towards the right, hey, what's that? In the dark, we couldn't tell, but it was too small to be human. A short figure was moving right along the line where the waves were coming in. It looked like it was almost gliding. We were all looking at it moving from our right towards our area. We were thinking maybe it's a street dog. When it reached where we were sitting, it stopped. At this point, it was dead ahead, sitting silently right where the waves crashed on the beach. It was maybe 20 feet away from us, but we still couldn't tell what it was due to the darkness. All of us went silent. It just sat there for a good minute or two. One of us even yelled out, who's that? With no response. Then suddenly, it started coming towards us fast. Needless to say, we all freaked the fuck out. All seven of us just started running as fast as we could towards the hotel. We literally didn't stop until we reached the hotel gates. The guard at the gate saw us all panicking and running and asked, what's going on? We tried to explain as best as possible. He said not to worry and would go check it out. Few of us, including me, went with the guard as we realized we left some of our shoes and other items in the craze. As we were approaching the spot with the guard and his torch, we could see in the distance that a small figure was still there. Finally, when we were close enough, it was evident that it was a short person sitting tucked up with their head down wearing a white dress, I couldn't see the face at this point. We all started screaming and yelling, who are you? What's wrong with you? No response, still head down. The guard approached it with the flashlight directly aimed at the head. He yelled again without a response. Then, just as he was about to nudge it with his boot, she looked up and directly at the flashlight without a single word or even a bat of the eye. It was an aged, frail woman who looked well over 80. She just kept looking directly at the flashlight without saying a word or blinking. It was freaky AF. We decided to just grab our stuff and go. The guard said he never saw this person around and casually mentioned she was probably some mentally challenged local. It's been over 15 years, and I still don't know what to make of it. My dad had a cousin that died before I was born. People never talked much about her, so it honestly seemed like people had forgotten her. Recently, at a birthday party, she was brought up. Apparently she had been missing for weeks before her brother found her at a beach, not that far away from their town. The scene was horrible, and it traumatized her brother for life. At first, it looked like a suicide or an accident, that she had gotten drunk and drowned, then washed on shore. But things didn't add up. She was an excellent swimmer and had competed in many competitions, plus she never drank alcohol because she didn't like it. After the discovery of her death, everyone in the family was sent a letter to never mention her again and that she had died. Of course everyone was confused and concerned, because how could this suddenly happen? Everyone respected her parents' wishes and decided to keep quiet. 
Now here's what actually happened. My dad's cousin had a boyfriend with whom she had been together for five years. But one day she wanted to break up because she was a lesbian. This didn't settle well with her boyfriend, so he murdered her. After her death, the police wanted to investigate what had happened, but her parents turned down the investigation and case. It's extremely sad to know that her murderer is still walking around free and that justice was never served. I have a creepy story. I've said it a few times on here, but it comes to mind every time I see these posts. When I was about 17 to 18, my friends and I wanted to go biking at night since there was a full moon and plenty of light. We knew this park had nice paved trails and was technically closed at dusk, so no one would be there. We all get our bikes and head up the trail into this hilly, wooded area. At the top, there's a water tower and a really nice view of the city. We stopped up there for a bit and decided to head deeper into the woods, which sloped back down a bit. We're going to crack up, just being teenagers. At one point, we come across a bridge we had never seen before and some chains that went across it. We figured they were building a new part of the trail and wanted to investigate it. The bridge went over a small creek that led into a lake that had a bunch of dead trees in the middle of it, and it looked eerie in the moonlight. It was probably a couple hundred yards across to the other side, and we decided we wanted to see what was over there. But a few hundred feet from the bridge, we start hearing what sounded like old men laughing from across the lake, which was in the pitch black from our point of view. We all stopped and just stared at each other. It lasted quite a while, maybe 30 seconds, creeping us all out. Then it got dead quiet. You know how forests usually have sounds of some sort, like bugs or birds or leaves rustling? It was nothing in that moment. And all of a sudden, it sounded like hundreds of frogs were going nuts all over the lake. It got so loud, we could barely hear each other. It freaked us all out, and we took off back towards the bridge. Right then, clouds moved over the moon, and we couldn't see a thing. We were all trying to see as best we could, but we had to turn on our phone flashlights, and we could maybe see 30 feet in front of us. I was leading the way originally when we found the bridge, and so now I was at the very back, trying not to hit anyone. It was probably just me freaking out, but I got the sensation of being chased by something, and I wanted to get the hell out of there. A few hundred feet past the bridge, it felt like something grabbed my front tire and just flipped me backwards somehow. My phone went flying, but I instantly grabbed it, hopped back on the bike, and pedaled like mad to catch up to my friends. It was weird, though, because when I fell off, I just suddenly couldn't see or hear them anymore. So I was yelling, trying to get them to wait because I was freaking out. I have never pedaled that hard in my life. They finally stopped at the water tower and said they had been there for 5 minutes waiting for me. I don't know how that was possible because I was on the ground for maybe 20 seconds, but I still remember the intense fear I had that night. I'm not sure what those people were doing at that lake in the middle of the night, but I'm kind of glad we never found out. I already have an intense fear of darkness because I suffer from sleep paralysis, so being in the woods in the pitch black by myself after all that was not fun. I grew up watching scary movies. Sunday mornings after church with my dad. At night, my imagination flourished with boogeymen and whatnot, waiting for me to peek at them. I kept my eyes shut, trying not to look like I was deliberately keeping them shut. I prayed in my head. I sang church songs in my head. Anything to not look until I finally fell asleep. In our freshman year of high school, we moved to a newer and bigger house. I remember being reassured by the scriptures painted on the tile in the kitchen and bathrooms. I just knew that a house built by a pastor wasn't buried on an Indian burial ground, the site of a murder or other horrendous crime. I think I sensed something and tried rationalizing it. All four bedrooms shared a hallway, with three doors opening into it at one end and the master bedroom opening into it at the other. I wake up in the middle of the night and peek, just knowing there won't be anything. In the corner opposite my open door is a shadow that is somehow more black than the rest of the darkened hallway. And I know it's watching me. And I know it because I saw it. And I make out a tall, slender figure in a top hat before I'm under my covers, eyes screwed tight, praying in my head, and singing all the songs in my head. I am absolutely refusing to move my muscles until I eventually pass out. Decades later, my younger brother and I were reminiscing about our childhood. My husband tells me to tell my brother about the shadow in the top hat. My brother pales and describes this shadow before I can say anything else. Fucking freaked me out more than, hundreds of miles and years away, knowing the other times I saw it in the corner weren't the only times it was there. When I was 15, me and a friend walked along the canal, we'd walk several miles along it, about 90 minutes at a normal pace. We got to an area that's known for being family-oriented, with picnic benches around, a pub on the opposite side, and a well-populated midday. After about 30 minutes there, just before leaving, I asked a guy who had seen smoking if I could borrow his lighter. He obliged, I lit my cigarette, handed it back, 
and myself and my friend set off back to our local area. After about 15 minutes, we noticed the guy was behind us. We didn't think much of it, but there was a path that ran parallel, so we cut through some light trees and bushes and walked along that for a bit. The guy did the same. We swapped between the path and canal path a few times, each time, so did the guy. We knew if we sped up, we could cut the journey back to our area to 30 minutes. Up ahead, there was the option to leave the canal path onto the main road, but the day and time meant it wouldn't have any or much traffic, and it was in a not so great area. So we carried on, we had about a mile left, and this guy was still switching paths when we were, and we knew that the parallel path would end at the part where we were due to leave the canal and head towards home. To come off the canal, we needed to go onto the canal path, under a bridge, take an immediate U-turn, go up the slope to the bridge, and cross the bridge. Then we would be in a pretty dense wooded area with bushes. So we devised a plan, we would stay on the main path until the very last second, cut to the canal path, run under, up, and over the bridge, separate onto each side in the woods, and hope like fuck he didn't see us. Everything worked as we'd planned, and as we were both crouched behind bushes and trees, we could see this guy standing in the middle of the bridge, looking towards the direction he anticipated us going in, the direction we'd come from, and the direction we were hidden in. After what felt like the longest five minutes, he left the bridge. Myself and my friend stuck to the tree line hidden from the bridge until we were far enough up the path to run to the main road. Fuck knows what that guy wanted, but I've never walked along the canal again. I was forgetful and just plain absent-minded. I started college and locked myself out of the car for the millionth time. I didn't want to call my dad for obvious reasons, I'm a tool. I realized my phone was also in my backpack in the car, so I could head to school and make a call. A man in his vehicle sees me and offers to call someone for me. He dials the number and is just looking at me, and I become so keenly aware of the L shape of the lot I'm in and how I'm in the back with only one way out. He looks over, and I see two other guys walking towards us, he's clearly on the phone with one of them. I'm like, wrong number, hey? And he smirked. My brain is raging at my stupidity. By the grace of God, I see a familiar vehicle flashing lights, it's my dad. I'd also forgotten my laptop charger, he'd been trying to call me and thought I bet my dumbo kid locked herself out while going to pay for her parking ticket. I started bawling. I moved to get away, and one of the guys moved to be in my way. My dad rolls up like six inches from hitting the two men on foot, rolls down the window, and just starts describing the men aloud, two Caucasian men, both wearing blue sweaters, a third man in a truck. They were scared and scrambled toward the truck, but only one way out. I jump in my dad's car. Literally seconds later, a campus officer comes by. The girl that was with me grabbing the ticket noticed I wasn't walking behind her after, and she just asked them to check to see if I'd needed help. I'd what type of guardian angel type situation that was, but man, was I so grateful? I grew up in the Philippines with my aunt and uncle, now in the US with my mom, who both came from families that grew up in very rural areas. Now in the Philippines, there are tons of common urban legends and myths of monsters, ghosts, and spirits, but that's what those are. Legends. Never did I expect my aunt and uncle, and family in general, mother and other aunts included, to have such a vivid paranormal experience that caused them to move their homes. For context, my aunts, uncle, and mom involved in this story are the most pragmatic, business-oriented, no-bullshit, hard-ass, straight-to-the-point people I know. Super religious too. They're quick to call out bullshit. They'd reprimand us heavily if we got caught lying. People with extremely professional backgrounds and educations. But one time my older cousin brought up the conversation of witchcraft, very common in the Philippines, apparently. And how he doesn't believe in that bullshit, much like his parents, or so I thought. My uncle shot back, you should always be careful when accepting food or gifts from strangers or even acquaintances, especially if you don't know their background. Again, an expected statement from him, it could be Guyuma, a love potion, or some type of curse. This doubled down on my cousin's tirade and started calling out his parents for believing such a farce. Unable to defend their point, my uncle and aunt gave up and decided to tell everybody at the dinner table the story of why they left the city and moved to a slightly more rural area. Before I was born, they lived in an apartment within the city, but they were forced to move after my cousin, the one tirading, and I were born. Apparently, our births started attracting unwanted attention. There's a few bits of lore here you need to know. A swang is a type of monster that feasts on flesh. Can assimilate into normal society during the day can be your teacher, classmate, crush, neighbor, etc. can grow wings and fly. Is associated with bats and bat-like sounds. 
Tick Tick is a type of flesh-eating monster that specifically feeds on pregnant women's babies and young children. They climb the rooftops of houses and make a high-pitched, deep ticking sound as they walk on the roof. Hence the name, Tick Tick. The louder the sound, the farther they are. The softer, the closer. Silent, right there. For some reason, monsters in general like consuming babies, lore-wise. Also, the Tick Tick may or may not be a type of Aswang, I'm not sure. They're humans, though. Well humanoid with a very long, sharp tongue that can pierce through roofs and bellies. So my cousin gets conceived, and apparently he gets absolutely haunted. Lots of extremely unexplainable things start happening in the physical realm. They didn't get into the small details, but I remember some key details. They would buy garlic to hang on windows to deter the monsters. Sounds, ticking, squeaking from the rooftops, and bat-like noises, but loud, could be heard late at night, and they followed. And every time these things happened, my cousin would cry his heart out and never stop until morning. He would be a normal baby during the day. But the next night, he would just cry in terror out of nowhere. Three kids who lived next door that my aunt could still name today would camp out at my aunt and uncle's balcony some nights with slingshots and stones, shooting at the trees that surrounded the house to help protect the baby, who they got really attached to. My other aunt, who was a college student living with them or helping babysit, would have her own experiences when left alone with a baby. Electrical issues? There were multiple instances where the entire apartment building would be okay, and everyone had power except my family's room late at night. They had it looked at multiple times, but there was no possible explanation, uncle's an electrical engineer. It was so odd that it got the attention of their landlord and neighbors, that's how the three kids knew about the haunting. To combat this, they did tons of spiritually related practices, one of which was playing religious music over the cassette tape player as loud as they could when night came. Except one night, which my aunt recalled as the scariest experience so far. They were playing the cassette tape. It was near midnight. My cousin was fast asleep near his mom, who was up late doing something else while my aunt was studying, she was in college. All of a sudden, the religious music player stopped playing. Dead in its tracks. Like the machine just froze. Then they heard a quiet but absolutely loud sound from outside the window, eek eek. And boom, my cousin let out the shrillest, nerve-wracking, bone-chilling wail my aunt has ever heard. From fast asleep to sudden cries of death in a split second and this went on for hours. And both my super hard ass and pragmatic, no-nonsense aunts were scared shless. The music player was fine the next day. But my cousin would still continue his crying, and the haunting would persist here and there. I guess it was tolerable until I was born two years later. Then it got so bad that they decided to just move. They told this story out of straight-up concern and warning. They almost didn't even want to say it. We were 17 and 19 when they told us, so it took them a long time to get to it. My cousin wouldn't budge and claimed yokai was just a basic scientific explanation for stuff they couldn't comprehend, so they cried monster, yokai. I can't help but believe it. Simply because throughout my years here in America with my mom, she would drop paranormal experiences and references out of nowhere as seriously as she would discuss the stock market and why I should invest my money. She's had experiences during pregnancy and as a child. She would say things like, we've got to do a background check on whoever you date just to make sure they aren't witches. This? Coming from the same woman who lived a military lifestyle, is it all about believing only the information you see in front of you? If my family were a bunch of nut jobs with no education or credibility to their name, I wouldn't care. But they're all intelligent, westernized, well-educated professionals who dug themselves out of poverty through sheer hard work and ingenuity. They're ruthless-minded. They're so no-nonsense, it hurts. And yet there they are, spouting stories of monsters and spirits and how we should be careful towards the paranormal, with the same serious warning face they'd give me when they talk about drugs and cigarettes and avoiding them. So yeah, how can I not believe them? So I'm going to be careful. And you should, too.